The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not reflect the views or endorsement of any entity. Nothing being said on this podcast should be considered as investment advice. Another Friday morning. In the hot seat with me is the one and only Eli. Eli, how you doing, buddy? Let's go. Just got back from Tokyo. Amazing trip. We've Let's got, go. We've got a lot to talk about. We do. We've got, I know K Rose out today. Yep. Uh, we thought we'd fill in the uh, the goat who uh, who was in Tokyo. We've also got a special guest. I'll let you tease him in a minute. Yep. Uh, and then the third co-host for today, the one, the only, the man with the math. That's Sam NFT Statistics. How you doing, Sam? What's up, guys? How you doing? <laughs> the slight delay the slight in delay. the what's up is the best. We like it. Um, well, yeah. What were we gonna say, Sam? How are you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. It's uh, it's always fun to be here with you guys. This is gonna be a fun one. Well, let's um, let's not delay. We're yep. live. We've got a we've got a great a great show ahead. Uh, why don't we kick it off with Tokyo? Because you just got back. Um, I was just uh, chatting with folks. I mean, like the, yeah. the thing I keep hearing was how awesome bright moments in Tokyo really was these yeah. last couple of weeks. Why don't you, why don't you kick us off and share a little bit? Yeah. So, uh, was there for bright moments, Tokyo. Um, and you know, the, my, the thing I come away with from those three, four five days was it really felt like we were part of a movement, you know, and like when you're behind your screen yeah. and you're on Twitter, there's a, an element of that, but being surrounded by collectors and artists and in these different environments that, that we'll talk about throughout the show, it really felt like this is an art movement. And, you know, the people there are really the catalyst for that in many ways. And like, that's what this experiential part uh, of this space allows for someone to experience and feel and be reminded of really. So that was sort of the primary takeaway is like, uh, setting aside the the market and the commodification of these works, uh, it's really about the people, the artwork, the technology, mm. and the relationships in many ways. Yeah. And like I keep coming back to this idea of, you know, we're seeing the same people IRL a couple times a year now. In five years and ten years, like you know, you foster real relationships totally. uh, with people over time. So Seth is going to join us from Bright Moments later in the show. Uh, and we'll we'll dig into all things bright moments, uh, but a great couple of days out there. That's awesome. And um, we'll uh, we'll kick off the show with a slightly different topic. I think we'll start broad and then narrow down as we go through. Sam, um, you have been relentlessly staying on top of the da the data over the last couple of months. Um, you're servicing some great insights in your dailies. I thought it would be great to kind of kick off and and set the stage for today's um, today's show just with a quick update on the market. We can spend a couple of minutes on this, um, but why don't you jump in and tell us what you're seeing uh, on chain? Sure. I mean, I think I kind of divide the market into three buckets. The first is kind of the PFP stuff that's now mostly traded on Blur. The second is art blocks and GM Dow and kind of brain drops and a bit more of those kind of collections of art projects. And then the last is one of ones. And I, th I think what jumps out at me about art blocks and one of ones is just how much volumes are down, you know? So every day I'm highlighting the top four art block sales in my, you know, on my, on my show. And, you know, we've had a few days in a row where, where no project other than Chromie squiggles did more than five ETH of volume. You know, mm -hmm. it used to be like when I started this kind of segment of the show, it would be like 10 different projects. We're doing 10 ETH more of volume. And, and that was already felt down, but now there's just very little liquidity there. So, that's one of the themes that, that I've kind of seen. And I think we're seeing the same thing in one ones You know, it's like we get the occasional X copy sale like on secondary or Sam Spratt. You know, he hasn't done something in a while, but there are a couple of people who are still commanding like serious prices. But we're seeing a lot of one of ones for people who have had sales in like the 20 to 30 range coming in like the five to 10 range or just not that many sales. So I think it starts out with a little bit less volume and then, then prices go lower. So that's kind of been a theme in the art space. I think in the PFP space, we've actually over the past week, we've had a bit of a rebound. Um, you're starting to see some stories pop up that people are getting excited about. So like meme land has been completely on fire with, with captains and pudgy penguins, you know, pudgy penguins of course had, 
Uh, they, they launched their toy yesterday, which just got a lot of people excited about the story. And I saw the you price buy has one, gone Sam. from 4 to 4.8 ETH. So there's been a lot of cool stuff happening, I think, in the PFP space. The other thing we've seen is that volumes have come down. And I actually think that volumes down is a good thing. The reason for that is at least when you're talking about PFPs. And the reason is over the past you know few months, like 80% of high-end PFP volume has been on Blur. And like over the past month, at least, more than half of the trades are people dumping into bids. And I think that that has broadly scared people away and made people like just kind of less interested in the space. Or, you know, I think rightly, it just made people hesitant to want to buy because you know that there are kind of these supply blocks lurking that could dump so quickly. So I think kind of the first step towards normalization and people getting more confident is seeing volumes come down a bit, even though they're already very low, just fewer people dumping into bids. And we're seeing that like as volumes have come down, prices have stabilized a little bit. So overall, I'd say those are kind of like the main trends, you know, a few secular stories, really low volume for the art space and PFPs showing a little bit of hope. Like we, we've just seen a little bit of, I don't know, a little bit of positive energy kind of in pockets here. Owen One Force, of course, another one that's gone from like 0.9 to 1.5 ETH. So, you know, just a, a few secular kind of stories that, that seem positive. Before we jump into uh, one of those categories in particular, I think we'll spend a little bit more time on our blocks. And we, we'll tease through the volume and then we'll kind of tee it up for some of the 3AC stuff that's coming down the pike here. Um, I'm curious, when you look at things like ACK's you know, big sale uh, two weeks ago, or you look at Milady's, you know, up to four and a half or five ETH or wherever the heck those things are, or you look at $8 million being sent to Ben Dot ETH. Um, I guess like, what are these markers of in your view, Sam? Because I, I totally agree with you. Like vols are all low right now on some of the, the collections that I think everyone would deem to be quite significant. And we can like talk about that here in a minute. But in terms of primary appetite and also some of like the speculative behavior that you know it continues to exist i'm curious what you make of some of these signs uh and what you think that means are these leading indicators are these lagging indicators how are you taking this information and and running it through your mental models for what happens next uh, you know I'd, I'd put captains in that bucket too you know captains mm -hmm. have gone from four to nine eth um you know i I don't think the issue right now is that people don't have ETH to spend. Like we are like, this is very different. You know, the last time NFTs went down as much as they've gone down over the past three months, the last time that happened was the Luna collapse. Mm. And at that point, people were like, damn, I need to get out of NFTs so I can pay my rent. Like I like that was like, I'm worried about liquidity in my native currency that I need to, to get by. I think it's a very different environment right now. Like over the past three months, you know, triple Q's, like NASDAQ is doing very well. S&P 500, it, you know, has had a pretty strong stretch. Like risk parameters, like the VIX are, are, are pretty low. Ethereum and Bitcoin have done fine. You know, it's been, you know, it hasn't been a super volatile period for, I mean, it's been, you know, Bitcoin and, crypt and Ethereum are always volatile, but relatively speaking, it hasn't been terrible. I, I think that people have ETH right now. Mm -hmm. And one thing we know, certainly from the mean coin pump, is that people are willing to spend on a good gamble on a good you know on something that's pumping people these are momentum assets like people want to chase it i think people have eth to do it i just think the biggest concern right now is that prices are going down and people don't want to chase stuff that's going down you know and, and we've seen that i think this is one of the most interesting things about blend right is that people now have access to so much eth to so much liquidity but blend hasn't sent prices higher you know, Board Ape Yacht Club, Mutant Ape Yacht Club, Zuki, CryptoPunks, D Gods, they're all down or flat versus when they launched on Blend, giving pretty much anyone capital who wanted it. And I think that what that shows us is that the hesitation isn't like people don't have the liquidity to buy. It's that they're concerned that the prices are going to go down, so they don't want to get involved. But when you yeah. see positive energy, when you see things where there's positive momentum, like Milady, you know, with Elon tweeting about it, like Captains, where there's meme line coming up, like Pepe, like Pepe the Token, uh, like this piano set from ACK who has a pretty impeccable track record. Like, yeah, people are willing to, to spend ETH on it. Um, and I don't think that's different now than it, than it's ever been. Yeah. Makes total sense. Um, let's take, let's, uh, so great analysis. Uh, let's unpack some of this through the lens of a very specific collection that I think everyone on this show has thought a lot about, which is our blocks and our yeah. blocks curated. Um, Eli, I'm curious, maybe you can kind of piggyback from some of yeah. the, the things and notes that Sam has made and, and maybe uh, 
share some of your opinions there on what's happening in that ecosystem right now. Yeah, so I think there's, um, I mean, Sam, you so accurately touch on um, the volumes across those collections being way down, um, all things art blocks. And I think there are sort of two things that come to mind for me. So the first is, you know, 20 years ago, uh, any generative art, computer art was conceptually interesting. Um, it, now, you, you know, I think um, a couple years into art blocks uh, lifespan, uh, most of the low hanging fruit conceptually has been picked off. And so uh, in a bull market, that's okay because sort of anything that comes from that brand um, and from the great artists who release work through the, in particular, the curated vertical um, thrives. In a down market, I think collectors start to do this calculus that's more nuanced. It's, um, it's evaluating the brand of art blocks first and foremost, and then it's the conceptual nature of the work. It's the visual outputs themselves. It's the artist as a so-called marketer. And uh, when, you, when you do that calculus and when you consider that wider set of considerations, the number of works and the number of collections that look really attractive across all of those dimensions is perhaps quite a bit smaller. Um, and, and, you know, I think um, Art Blocks did so well and some of, the, some of this, I think, and you can speak to this, Derek, was intentional and some was community-driven. But to have these different sort of framings of collections. So we had um, season one and, and the season uh, nomenclature and that framing or that wrapper. Uh, and by extension, you had collectors desiring full sets. Uh, with some of that going away as well, um, you know, I think it... Uh, those are interesting drivers of collectability as well. And so in a world where you have a down market and, and people are perhaps broadly avoiding these risk assets, as, as Sam always talks about, and people are doing, collectors are doing uh, this slightly more nuanced calculus on why something is interesting versus why maybe it's a little less interesting, you're seeing a lot less volume and a lot less, a lot fewer, many fewer collectors really leaning in, I think, on, uh, on art blocks. And um, I think that ultimately probably changes, but it also, I think, is healthy for two reasons. I think both on the art block side, um, you know, it really, and you're on the curatorial board, um, probably, I would imagine, really pushes you guys to ask those questions when you're doing curation, you know, from a conceptual basis. There's a release next week with, with Operator that I think hits all of these marks so, so effectively that we can maybe talk about. Uh, but also, from a collector perspective, learning to do some of that calculus, consider these broader set um, of considerations instead of it's art blocks curated, so I'm going to mint, so it's going to be valuable. Uh, I think ultimately that will be healthy. Yeah, these are all great points. Um, I don't. I, I would say I don't largely disagree with any of those. I think to your point, in a time, and if I'm going to combine the feedback that I'm hearing from from yourself and from Sam, it's like from a time where people are less likely to go out on the risk curve and find new artists or find new projects or find new collections to support. Um, that level of sophistication around how they want to move money around in this space, that bar gets higher, and as a result, it's not that work doesn't sell or it can't be appreciated, but people are more um, concerted about and sophisticated about where and how they participate in these markets economically. I think that's right. Uh, touching on you know something that you just said about this upcoming drop, mm. uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about Operator and I can jump in and why I might find that one a little interesting, but then I'd love to also return and shift away from the primary market mm. in new buyers and new artists to the secondary market where I know Sam has pulled some data. But first, I'd love to hear you riff on Operator and I can chime in with some thoughts as well. Yeah, so I'm, at, I'm, I'm interviewing Operator later today. Cool. And we'll have a, a podcast interview out with them, I think Tuesday, the day before their drop on Wednesday awesome. of next week. Uh, I met Anya in Tokyo. Actually, she was out there for, um, for Bright Moments. So I'll save most of the conversation there. But, but again, this is just um, you know, a project that blends uh, deep sort of conceptual uh, thinking, technology, but also visual output in a way that sort of combines to make, I think, a really compelling collection and project. Um, so, but we'll, we'll dig in more uh, a little bit over the course of the coming days. Yeah. 
I've got just a quick, yeah. a fun story about this work in particular, which I'm also very excited about. Um, when I first showed my wife the Chromie Squiggle in November of 2020, and I was <laughs> yeah. explaining to her how this autonomous procedural rules-based system mm -hmm. worked, where like my purchase was acted as the seed against this algorithm, and what I was presented with was, you know, purely based on chance. Uh, and um, when I was explaining, she's a professional dancer. Um, and trained and has thought very deeply about conceptual art uh, in the form of dance. Um, she was like, oh, this is like Merce Cunningham. Mm. And Merce Cunningham, uh, from having learned a little bit about Operator, is really one of the inspirations behind um, their work mm -hmm. and extending that form of chance and rules-based dance into now algorithmic art. And so I'm curious to see how the drop is, how, how it goes, and kind of dig into the, the technology behind what they're doing around chance and randomness in the form of motion mm. capture and software uh, against body movements and translating that into uh, a chance and rules based yeah. art form on our block. So I'm, I'm excited about operator as well, but transitioning over to the secondary yeah. market for our blocks, Sam, I know you've done some digging around some of the top collections on our blocks, what their current market caps look like and where these things, how these things are currently being traded. So maybe you can riff a little bit on that. Oh, oh we lost Sam's I think we lost audio. Your audio, Sam. Oh, my bad. Let me get here. I can, uh, I can remove my screen. These are a couple of the charts we talked about yesterday. Just total market cap. I think, I think these five are the biggest in our blocks. I don't know if that, if that resonates with you, Derek. But you know, Squiggles at 150 million market cap. It ends about 67 million. Ringers at 39. Gazer's I think elevated deconstructions uh, would be up there between three and four. But uh, this is largely right. Got it. Yeah. Um, so, so, so those. I mean, one of the interesting things happening right now is that very few are listed. Um, you know, if, if like only eleven Fidenzas are, are listed, only nine Ringers are listed, I believe. Um, so, like, I and, and I think part of that, I, this is just on OpenSea. Yeah. Uh, I think part of that is kind of like exchange diversification happening. I think part of it is when mm. when, when trades are when there's so few trades, like. It, it, listings just expire you, you know you yeah. have listings for one month to three months you know they just expire when, when there's so few trades that happen um but yeah, yeah. They, you know this is also kind of an interesting thing that's happening out there and then this this is a chart here that looks at the percentage of trades on art blocks that have been sellers yeah. selling into bids versus someone seeing a listing they like and buying it over the and, and it's one month trailing so over the past month you know half of the trades have been people who are just taking whatever liquidity they can get as yeah. opposed to someone who is trading, you know, a buyer initiating the trade. So this is one of the, this is one of the kind of things. I, I don't know if I'd say, say worrying it happens, but like just kind of when you look at the history of this collection, like it is very rare yeah. um, that to have something like this. I'm throwing one more chart on here, uh, which is just total trade volume, seven yep. day trailing. And we're basically at the lowest that we've been. Um, yeah, which I just throw in. So I, I think all of these just point to lack of activity, lack of liquidity, um, which yeah, it's, and I, I think to e, what Eli said really did resonate with me. I think there was a time where you thought you could buy stuff and you would have exit liquidity if you wanted it, and you were kind of just taking a bet on momentum, or you bought something because you liked it. And I think right now people are when you buy something, you have to realize like I might not have exit liquidity for a long time. And yeah. I think that that kind of changes the calculus of when people like, you know, when people decide to buy an NFT in general and you have to start thinking like, is this an NFT that I think has value in five to 10 years? Like, is this an artist who has established provenance in a way or who has like built their personal following and reputation and shown an ability to stay relevant? Um, or, you know, or is it a work that is so interesting? It's going to stay relevant for a long time, you know, and I think. That, I think that's one of the reasons that Chromie Squiggles have been a little bit stronger. I think it's just one of those collections. People just feel like it has its name etched in history a little bit, and it's just going to maintain that that value for a long time. But th th those are some of the thoughts that kind of jumped to me when when Eli, uh, yeah, you know, w when I heard Eli saying what he was saying. Yeah, I think Sam, just quickly, Derek, I think Sam, yeah, those two uh, slides in parallel, the listing number and then followed by the, the Weath versus ETH, like those tell a story together, right? Because um, a, as you show, most trades are, are, are happening through Weath bids and, or accepting Weath bids. And so listing becomes less of a, listing percentage becomes less of a, 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 a 
meaningful metric, I think, in this case. Uh, Derek, quickly to you, I'm curious, based on everything sort of Sam showed and is talking about, uh, who is a buyer, do you think, in this market? Like, what are those, those maybe uh, segments of collectors who yeah. um, are maybe sort of consistently leaning in uh, and sort of undeterred uh, in this market? What do you see? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, I'll say two things. Um, the f and the first thing I'll say will be a lead up to answering your, yeah. your actual question. But as I reflect on um, Sam's slides just now, I, it always dawns on me that for some of these, these collections, let's call it like the top five to 10 collections that have the largest market caps on our blocks, and I think about each collection as an economy, like mm. these economies are actually quite small. Um, it doesn't take a lot of new marginal buyers to actually move the price of these economies north. And so, um, I mean, I uh, re recognizing that a number of these assets are trading at some, you know, five to 10% discount mm. from a wheat bid from where the listing price is. The, f the fact is, it's, is, you know, there's five pieces in certain collections that are up for sale yeah. or in a 10,000 piece collection, there's less than 70 that are up for sale. Um, and as I think about, you know, the importance of some of these collections and the fact that new buyers will arrive in the future, given everything we know about the properties of this technology and this art form mm. and where we're moving as a society. And the fact that the number of people that now own a digital object is skyrocketing, you know, year over year. Um, my view is like these economies are going to look much larger in a few years than they do today. That gets me to, well, like, how is that going to happen? Like who yeah. are the, who are these, these segments that are going to participate in these economies? Who are the marginal buyers today? And the truth is, is the marginal buyer today is probably someone who has a lot of capital and not a lot of exposure to these economies yet, but hmm. understands the vision of what I just proposed. And it's going to be, you know, in large part, it's going to be, uh, funds. It's going yeah. to be high net worth individuals. It'll be contemporary art collectors who want to put a position on or get exposure to this digital wrapper and yeah. this asset class. And in that way, a lot of the next leg of the journey is educating and storytelling and explaining the properties of this technology and the importance of these collections and the things that, you know, organizations like art blocks and bright moments and super rare are doing, um, to be able to, you know, adequately de-risk or, explain or demonstrate the value of what we're all doing here. Um, so the answer to your question, I think, is it's a combination of education, it's a combination of time, uh, but in my view, these things are, are gonna look much different in the next couple of years than they do today once some of these things start to ossify. Yeah, yeah, I love that that perspective. Um, the, very much related to everything, uh, liquidity and volume and art blocks is, of course, the, the three AC, Yep. Sotheby's um, so-called grails uh, sale that's happening right now. And over the course of the coming months, I think there's a, an, an auction or a sale ongoing at the moment with, I think, a, a two Fidenzas, a CryptoPunk, a glyph. an Autoglyph, uh, at least one ringer. Yeah. Um, I think I saw a squiggle in there, too. Is there a squiggle? I thought so. Yeah. I might be wrong about that, but we'll have to double check. So there's a bunch of interesting dimensions of this that we could we could talk about. The, the first that comes to mind is um, provenance. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think uh, to sort of dovetail from your point, Derek, for large collectors in particular, but but maybe more broadly, provenance of sort of prior ownership is incredibly important. And I've heard that directly from a number of the funds uh, who are large collectors in this space. So I'm curious, um, you know, uh, in terms of provenance with these works from Dimitri and mm. Tyler and mm. Eric yeah. and, and Larva Labs, Matt and John, is the, the, the on-chain provenance of these works having been owned by 3AC, then sold through Sotheby's and, and transferred through that Sotheby's Grail's wallet, is that part of an interesting story or is that part of a, does that detract uh, from its for, value or enhance its value? That's right. Yeah. What do you think? Got a lot of thoughts on this one. Yeah. Um, so when I think about provenance, I don't necessarily think that there's a clean answer. Um, when I think of provenance, I think of it, like just it's raw data and it's the stories that we tell around that raw data that give something cultural value or significance or, you know, detract from its overall value. And so when I think about 
three arrows cap uh, three arrows and and what they stood for and being this you know far out on the risk curve hedge fund venture fund um that went way over leveraged and mm-hmm. the hubris uh, and the lack of humility but also the power that that organization had for years they were considered you know one a dominant force in our industry only to you know go toe to toe with this technology and be completely wiped out and insolvent and have to file for bankruptcy to me there's such an interesting footnote in history mm. with the fact that they had the capital had the size had the horsepower and the you know the mental bandwidth to choose this collection specifically and assemble it at a time when you know the market was really starting to wrap their heads around how value will accrete to these things that uh, I I certainly believe that there is an amazing story there that is being told through its on-chain provenance. And the fact that, you know, Sotheby's is st- stepping in and working with the trustee of the bankruptcy to be able to orderly, you know, bring these to market in a way that's thoughtful. I think, um, if anything, this highlights their collectability rather than detracts from it. Yeah. Yeah, that made sense. I mean, you, we, we see obviously in the, the traditional art market that uh, these types of stories can be additive in terms of value. Mm-hmm. The, the sort of far end of the spectrum is, you know, looting and stolen goods yeah. that then have um, a, a different framing yes. around their, their future collectability. Uh, I don't think that's quite the case yeah. here, but I think for some... Um, well, I'll speak for myself. Yeah. I think I would rather not own a work that has that provenance relative to some of the other options, whether it's minting or you minted something and I, I mm. buy it from you. That feels to me like um, a sort of, um, perhaps it lacks some of that complexity, but for me that feels like a, a sort of a more pure yeah. ownership uh, path that, that's attractive. That, that's, I mean, my it's perspective. A good point. Yeah, no, I like it. Sam, do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to I, I tend to agree with Derek in the sense that I think there are a lot of NFTs you can own. Mm. Like there, there, there's just a lot out there. So I think the question of what has a story behind it that's relevant, like uh, a collectible owned by Al Capone or owned, owned by people who don't yeah. have the greatest track record of history but are at least notable, probably would increase it in value relative to all the other collectibles. <laughs> are out you there saying Derek's not you know, notable? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, if Derek owned one, then I'm like double bidding. <laughs> uh, you know, but so I know. I think. I, so I, th- I think there is a story there. Like with all this stuff, just motion creates motion, and story is better than yeah. no story. I, I just think like when it comes because there's so many NFTs out there. There's so much great art. Like, what are the pieces that are going to be relevant in ten years? Like wh- whether three arrow capital enters that level of notoriety, I don't mm-hmm. even know if it's true. You know, I, I don't like. It's an interesting story. I personally. I'm grossed out by it because I, I lived in Hong Kong. Mm. You know, mm. these guys are based in Singapore, Hong Kong guys. I have a few friends who, who I have a friend who worked for them. I have a couple friends who invested in them who lost a lot of their net wealth. They haven't got a single apology from 3A Aero Capital. 3A Capital hasn't announced doing mm. any, hasn't admit that they did anything wrong. 3A Capital wasn't investing their money. They were investing other people's money, other people's family savings that they spent years working for, and they lost it all, and they never said sorry, and they're tweeting poetry about oysters. Like, Mm. I just think this is a (laughs) dumb story of people who didn't deserve the attention that they got and who lost other people a lot of money, and were kind of like, just kind of an illusion. So to me, it's not that exciting of a story to get excited about, but, you know, I'm just, I'm phrasing the story Derek just said about going toe to toe with the market and the create the technology. Like I don't know, I, I find these guys a bit more criminal than that. But that's just mm-hmm. that's just I, because I, I have a personal connection to yeah. the story. I don't I don't disagree. I think uh, I think I think we would largely uh, fall in the same camp there. I guess uh, my like the last point I'll make uh, just from my end is, you know the the fact that they were able to. I think part of the story that's being missing here, as I describe it, is uh, they worked with. A group that was, you know, uh, driven by Vincent Van Doe, who's one of the largest NFT collectors in the world, and who has set the trend on a number of different artists and collections. And um, there is a really powerful narrative there when you've got the largest fund in the world, one of the largest holders of many of the top blockchain projects, mm-hmm. working with one of the sharpest NFT collectors in the space 
with and to provide capital and size to be able to put on positions on what Vincent Van Do and his team believe to be the most culturally significant collections. Um, there's there's a curation that went into that and a thoughtfulness, and it gets back to why I think Sotheby's is calling this 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 project Grails, yeah. and it it's because through provenance, through this information that exists on chain, we have a track record of three a three arrows capital the the creation of their wealth some of that being transferred for the sole purpose of finding and identifying cultural objects through Vincent van Doe mm-hmm. Vincent van Doe putting these positions on and taking a sophistication and a point of view around those collections acting as the great filter or the curator and then bringing them and paying sparing no price to find the best in every collection um, that to me is a story that I think collectors will collect around yeah yeah I think also um, you know going back to our discussion around liquidity and volume collectors know that there's i think 31 fidenzas for example that will ultimately be sold through sotheby's from the 3ac collection that's true of many of these other collections as well uh, meaning ringers and, mm-hmm. and otherwise and so you know maybe we're seeing sort of people wait for those to ultimately be sold through sotheby's uh, where maybe you can get a discount in some cases relative to uh, even accepting a, a wheat bid. Um, so I think we're going to see that happen and yeah. that will perpetually, well, for some period of time, perpetually, uh, affect probably sort of market efficiency beyond, um, the sales that are happening there. Derek, from a collector perspective, or maybe Sam as well, like I'm seeing that the, that Fidenza 725 at the moment has a bid of 130 K USD, uh, autoglyph 187, 230, I think, uh, and there's an 18% buyer's premium on, on these uh, purchases. It closes today, I believe, that uh, this portion of the sale. Are those, like, is that a discount? Is, does that feel sort of appropriately priced? I don't have a, a really good sense. I believe, so I need to go through and look at that, but is that Fidenza Micro? Yes. Then I think that is probably underpriced. Yeah. Um, but I'd be curious to see where bids land yeah. as the uh, as it progresses. I think that might be a six for Autoglyph, which would put that around, I think, fair market, maybe a little under fair market. Mm-hmm. I'd need to go in and look at these exact pieces yeah. in particular. I will say both of those are above the floor price for mm-hmm. those collections right now. Um, but I would say maybe below where I would believe those would, would end up and settle out, just given the types in, uh, uh, of, of assets that, that they are within these respective collections. Yeah, that made sense. What did you say the autoglyph bid, bid was, Eli? Uh, 230 uh, KUSD at the moment. Got it. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that, I think that still puts it yeah, right around the floor. But I, my, my sense with I, my sense with all this stuff, again, the stuff I was saying there was just my personal bias, you know, and I think, you know, I, but I, the bigger question here, I th- or just to touch on the auction stuff, like the prices they put as their estimates were like so low. Yes. It was almost like the original estimate for the autoglyph was below the bid was below the actual, like the actual bid mm. on OpenSea was higher than the high end of their estimate. Did we the ever? Beginning. So, and I've talked to Michael about this. I think there's a strategy just around setting mm. low estimates. Yeah. Can you uh, unpack that for us, Sam? Houses. What did, what did Michael, I, what was the strategy there when you chatted with Michael? Oh, he, 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 we didn't, we didn't go deep in it. I just think there's a strategy here where they'd rather, you know, you, you, yeah. you don't want the prices to come in below your estimates, especially yeah. with something like this where it has to go. Like the, the, the seller here isn't going to say, no, that's too low for me. Mm-hmm. Like the seller is in a state that just wants money and isn't like trying to time the market here. So I think for them, there's just like, let's, you just want there to be momentum I yep. think, pushing things. You want higher, attractive prices be, to yeah. drive people in and then you want the prints to be higher than the estimates. Yeah, and you want the tweet to be, wow, we just got a, bu- a bit above the range, you know, yep. but these ones are below. The- I, I, th- that's just my general sense. That's just me talking, not uh, not yeah. Michael talking. But I, th- I think there is, a, this is like a, a tying kind of the two conversations together here, I think is just, a, 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 and when Seth comes in, I'm sure he'll, he'll have views here as well. But I think is... In a time that kind of the art blocks and this conversation with three hour capital is what what it, it's we're all trying to figure out what are the things that are going to be relevant in five years in 10 years in 15 years and i think with art blocks that's what's so hard for me like i love meridians is that going to be relevant in five years i love memories of chile and is emily's work going to be relevant in five years I, you know you love subscapes you love all these different pieces of art but it's very hard to know like we are going to get more attention but we're also going to get more art you know and it, and like i think that that is the 
calculus that Derek, you always have such good insight into whenever we chat on telegram or when we chat on the show. Um, there's so much out there and there's so much great stuff out there. Yeah. And I think that, that like just understanding what are the things we want to focus on? Cause right now you kind of have to play the five year game. Like yeah. flips aren't available right now. There's just, we're seeing people cross 20% bid ass spreads, you know? So you really have to be playing the long-term game as far as what's going to get relevance as that more money comes in. And I think that's the, that's the hard part. And it relates to both these conversations. Like is three hour capital is starry night. VVD has touched so much art. Like, yeah. is this a great question? You know, is the fact that he paid over $3 million for a ringer, a good thing, like mm. awesome to get to buy that, at, you know, a 90% discount to what he paid. Uh, I don't know. So th those, those are some of the questions on my mind. Great questions. Yeah. Um, Sam has all the answers or uh, Eli has all the answers. <laughs> so he'll, I'll let him jump in here. No, let's, uh, <laughs> to your point, uh, Sam, let's bring in Seth from bright moments. Let's go. Uh, Seth, are you, are you around? Are, are you there? Hello, hello. Hey, there he is. Seth. The so legend. For those, the legend. The legend. Uh, so for those who do not know, uh, Seth is the founder of Bright Moments. Um, I don't know what, uh, aside from founder, what else do you call yourself a Bright Moment, Seth? Old man. <laughs> the guru. <laughs> yeah. They call, old it, man. <laughs> they call you the guru when you turn your back. What makes someone old in this space? I would say I'm 41. <laughs> I say I'm old in this space, you know, but I feel like it's a moving scale. Seth, actually, Over 50. It, might, it might be helpful, Seth. I mean, you're, you've done a lot of amazing things, and I don't know if folks know that. So maybe yeah. take a couple minutes before we jump into Tokyo and Japan and the amazing work you're doing at Bright Moments to talk a little bit about yourself and your history and because um, you, you've been working on some very cool stuff for a very long time. Yeah. Thank you. Um, have two grown sons, more or less grown, Jacob and Charlie, so those are probably my biggest achievements. Mm -hmm. um, but but I, start, I started young during Web 1. I was, you know, mid-20s. I was in New York. We called it Silicon Alley. And <laughs> I started an early, an early web marketing company um, called Site Specific that was actually named after some of the experimental theater stuff I was doing, mm. you know, in high school and college. I went to uh, college in New York at Columbia and studied avant-garde theater and performance art and that kind of was kind of my lever into technology in a weird way trying to put the archives of contemporary artists on at the time the only kind of digital media format which was cd-roms so like early 90s before the web really uh, opened up and became commercial and then when the web hit um even though i think in europe and germany in particular there was a lot of support for digital media um in the States, in New York, and obviously Silicon Valley, it was all about the consumer internet. And so I really focused on that. And I was a web one, um, web two, and now web three, you know, entrepreneur. Um, importantly, back then, after I sold Site Specific in the late 90s, I went to work with Fred Wilson and Jerry Colonna, who had started Flatiron Capital. And I was an entrepreneur in residence there and got a front row seat at a real bubble deflating. Mm. So whatever we think we're going through in the in these crypto markets and with NFTs and it, it's not it's not nearly as catastrophic. Mm. And this the bid ask spreads were way more than, you know, mm -hmm. crossing twenty percent. Mm. So I have some pattern recognition there that I think helped. Um, coming out of that, you know, web two, I was, you know, there on the East Coast when, when Kevin was starting Dig. Um, and Flickr and Delicious. I was an early investor in Delicious. Uh, moved to California, um, co-founded a, a company, a really great company called Turntable FM. Oh, yeah. Some mm -hmm. people remember um, that really tried, and there was a, a class of companies that tried to reinvent the, the, the listening experience online and make it more social. Ultimately, the labels took over, and you know, Spotify is an amazing product, but it's not, I don't think it reflects the kind of innovation that I would have liked to see mm -hmm. in um online music um and then you know more recently you know coming out of that um you know did some early work on the facebook ecosystem doing social advertising in like 2007 2008 before facebook swallowed the world for those 10 years um and to make a long story short ended up with christy my partner we we met in san francisco we moved to venice beach a couple years ago i was 
completely done with startups and venture capital and you know a kind of um a kind of capitalism that's kind of coming to roost mm. that we've seen a lot of unintended consequences sort of the growth at any cost mantra and um and here in Venice Beach you know I'd been tracking nfts and collectibles during the pandemic i think like a lot of people i was fascinated with what was happening with meme stocks and gamestop and the kind of the tribal the kind of powerful ownership tribalism that happened around that um i was tracking and buying and selling nba top shot moments <laughs> and i think that you know moments obviously came to be used uh, and influenced the name bright moments and then at the beginning of 2021 um and i i was there for you know bitcoin and ethereum never in a huge way but obviously curious living in the bay um you know i saw when smart contracts came out and people were talking about them in two, 2014 it was always on the come then crypto kitties um and punks i didn't claim any i saw them it was kind of outside my what i was focused on and um and then I also started a uh, a blockchain community center in San Francisco called Node, hmm. and I think it was there. Now the ICO bubble burst, and so a lot of the, the mobility of all of these crypto entrepreneurs moving from community center to community center around the world never took shape. But I definitely got a sense of of the kind of communities that you could form when tokens were involved, mm. right? And this idea that we kind of take for granted of tokenized communities was a lot looser there because you didn't have um, you didn't have NFTs um, as a kind of membership class the way we do now, um, but it's definitely something I took note of. And so, flash forward to the beginning of, you know, 2021, you know, around the time that we met Derek, um, I was taking lots of photographs. Um, Christy was painting lots of paintings. Um, Super Rare and Foundation came out. I remember I was taking photographs of the sunset at Venice Beach using simple GAN models to turn them into synthetic videos. I showed it to Fred Wilson, you know, my old mentor, um, who maintains a, a place in Venice Beach and New York. And he said, oh, these are great. You should turn them into NFTs on foundation. And so I was like, sure, it sounds fun. I got an invitation. I put something up and, um, and it sold. Mm. And it was a light bulb moment for me because you know, with technology, things rarely happen twice if they're not going to happen mm forever and i think with nfts there was a sense of okay 2017 these crypto kitties and punks happened it may it could have been a one-off affair when it happened again or when it bubbled back up and when we saw that explosion you know during jpeg summer it just felt like okay this this is here to stay it felt like a really important creative unlock and so increasingly i just went all in emotionally and, and it it was never in the context of starting a company you know from the get-go i wanted to build a dao i wanted mm. to do it differently and i wanted to use a native form of crypto governance to kind of regulate crypto tokens right it just felt right um and also i didn't want to get involved with stock you know restricted stock and options mm. and pitching venture capitalists and trying to pretend like I knew it was going to happen in five years and that everything was going to go up and to the right. And so as you remember, and I will always point this out, you called it the meat space. I did. Um, there's something maybe in, in, in everyday life outside of a pandemic, it's not such a big thing, but meat space opportunities were so scarce a they couple years non-existent. ago. Non-existent. Right. And it was a radical thing to do, you know, sort of, radical ish to make an nft gallery online hmm. but to make an nft gallery offline it was kind of unheard of because it was almost like borderline illegal yeah right because the mask mandates were off and venice is a bunch of crazy hippies and masks are off and we're out there on the boardwalk but um there was something very special about that time and i think the combination of this new file format with this kind of energy that we tapped into in venice beach combined with you know a very fortunate but but lucky um collision with art blocks mm. just created something special and we've been kind of chasing the tail of this tiger ever since yeah i'd love to talk about all of the learnings that you've had going city by city and the lessons you've learned and the experiences and how it's 
been tailored for what what I've heard to be an amazing experience in Tokyo. Um, I'll just reflect quickly. I mean, you brought this up, Seth. The first time that we met was in early 2021. I had already invested in things like Super Rare and Art Blocks and a number of um, the marketplaces and galleries and infrastructure to, and software to support this, you know, this rise in, in digital objects and, and the 721 file format. And I remember after our conversation, I think we maybe spent an hour together. I was like, listen, there's obviously something interesting here, but we just don't invest in meat space. Like this is just not what we do. What and do you, I, when you guys say meat space, <laughs> what do you mean? I just meant physical bodies in a location um, as an extension of the primitives of this technology, which to me are very clean. It's a trust minimized ledger. It's digital objects that sit on that ledger. It's a UI layer that allows people around the world, whether on their mobile devices or their computers to engage with yeah. that ledger. What I fail to realize is that those invisible connections that we're making globally, mm -hmm. whether it's pushing code to Bitcoin core, or it's sending a transaction on the EVM, or it's engaging with the protocol, those invisible connections are actually quite powerful when you start to see them realized in human form with other people. And I remember uh, I was living down on the beach at the time. I walked over to the Venice Bright Moments, Seth, to hang out with you for a couple hours just to see the, the thing in, re in real life after we had already passed on investing. And I had this like light bulb moment where like I went through the minting flow, I got to spend time with you, I got to talk with other collectors, and I realized like this is, there is something special about teasing out these connections that are on the internet and actually creating a product and a platform that exists in the real world, um, which I think has led to a lot of the secret sauce and the, the template and the playbook as you've gone through city by city. Um, so full disclosure, I'm now a, very much a <laughs> member of the DAO and a big fan of what Seth is building, but it took some, it took some time for me to really grok exactly mm. why this was special. But once it clicked, it clicked. But um, yeah. I'd, love, I'd love to turn to you, Eli, yeah, and yeah. get your your take here. Well, yeah, Seth, uh, I had, I didn't realize that you had that um, that that background. Can you take us back to the? So was Tokyo? Uh, that was City Seven. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so take me back to uh, city or experience number one. I saw you post something, I think, on Twitter that had perhaps what was the first instantiation of this uh, adjacent to the Tokyo experience. Uh, take us back to that that very first um, moment, that first minting experience that you guys had. What were you trying to accomplish, evoke in people? Uh, and ultimately, what do you think sort of started to, to emanate from that experience? So, you know, as, as Derek knows, because Derek and Stephen really helped us architect the DAO that's now Bright Moments, that's entirely made up of these crypto citizens that we mint a thousand per city. Um, if we go back to the beginning, Tokyo was the seventh city, but the sixth real world city. Like mm -hmm. the first city is, is, we call it the Crypto Galacticans, but really that's the original DAO. Because when we started, we were ERC-20 tokens. Um, sort of conventional DAO, not an NFT DAO. And the idea was to use these ERC-20 tokens to govern a somewhat decentralized physical art, you know, NFT art gallery. And um, we organized around that. We got a space in Venice Beach. And our first show was with Jeff Davis, um, who's the creative officer at Artblocks. And he's been an artist in every single one of our cities. Um, and... And so that experience of sort of city number zero um, or city number one, you know, as it were, um, in Venice before we did the crypto Venetians was all about this meat space, right? All about, and I think what a lot of us take for granted, or maybe some people took for granted, is that you know, artists are not robots. I mm -hmm. mean, maybe some AI will be, but in the end, Jeff Davis, even though he makes these beautiful, um, you know, minimalist Donald Judd, like you know, like like light sculptures, um, and they're perfectly geometrical and abstract. Um, he's a great guy with a great wife from, you know, who lives in Phoenix and he's an artist and he wants to have an opening. Right. And that was the lure. It wasn't, Hey, work with bright moments and we'll do another drop online outside of your art blocks drop. It was, you know, come to Venice beach. We're sort of open ish in between COVID, you know, lockdowns. <laughs> 
you know, let's do a show on a Thursday night, you know? And so that was really how we started. And it was through that process um, that, you know, we realized the insight was, well, okay, we're going to have shows every so often um, and that'll be great. But what do we do in between shows? You know, it's three o'clock on a Tuesday in Venice Beach. How do you get someone to show up at a gallery? Now, is it enough to show, you know, people every day is in LeBron James Top Shot? Maybe, <laughs> maybe not. Um, you know, I think a lot of people have tried to just put NFTs yeah. on screens with a QR code and say we're open for business. And maybe at the height of the bubble, it worked for a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I think it was clear back then that that wasn't going to be enough. And so, you know, we needed to get creative about marketing and driving foot traffic. And so we said, okay, why don't we give away NFTs for free? People hopefully will pay the gas. So the gas was going to be 30 or $40 to mint a crypto Venetian, hmm. which was our homegrown version of crypto punks. Mm -hmm. We said, okay, we'll do a thousand crypto Venetians. We'll mint them only to people that show up at the gallery. And lo and behold, because we were already working with Jeff for his show, he's like, oh, you could use art blocks for that. And none of us really knew about art blocks and none of us were steeped in 20 year tradition of, you know, off chain generative art, although I'd like to believe we were. Um, it just seemed like a good idea. And he introduced us to his partner, Snowfro. And, and so we had some conversations and, and Phil and, and Chan and others like came up with this project num num number 95 on art blocks, which were the crypto Venetians. And what was unique about them, um, other than the fact that they were sort of these pixel art portrait PFPs that hadn't been done on art blocks yeah. before and were truly generative, um, was that you had to be there in person. And the way we forced that is you couldn't buy a token online to mint them. That you had to show up in person to the gallery. We, we transferred 10 BRT ERC20 tokens to your wallet. Mm. Um, they weren't on Uniswap. There was no liquidity pools. They were in our wallets as a DAO. And you'd come in, you'd mint your crypto Venetian and you'd walk out from the back and we'd play it on the big screen and it was like a day party. And initially it was very technical and bro -y, and Christy was like, you know, hmm. make this like a dager. And so Amicia, <laughs> her daughter, put on a bikini and Charlie, my son, uh, was DJing and <laughs> my other son, Jacob, was hyping people up and back. And it became an experiential thing because hmm. we, we didn't know what else to do. And it was fun. And people, and what was strange through all this is two things. One is um, the experience of revealing generative art in this, in this case, your character in person for the first time, you know, with the artist is a thing. Yeah. And we never would have known this unless we had tried it. And it, it, it brought some joy to a pretty joyless time. And people felt hopeful. You know, the metaverse was a thing. People were excited about bringing, mm. you know, bringing their characters to life. We had weird improv sessions uh, around when people minted their characters evening workshops where you'd give them voices in the Hollywood mm. setting. It was like ridiculous, but it was fun and there was no money attached. They were free. Right. And it was really a struggle to think whether people would pay the gas. And then what started to happen is people, there were art blocks collectors in Singapore or Switzerland mm. who couldn't travel, but made it a thing. They were completionists. So they had every single art blocks drop. Yep. up through number 94 and they saw this thing come out of the minter number 95 and they're like what the fuck is that i want one and the only people that had them were skateboarders and and surfboarders coming in and off the the um uh, the venice boardwalk who had walked into our our gallery because we had a sandwich board sign that said you know come in for free nfts <laughs> and so there was a weird crypto mule culture of the venice locals selling these things that they got for free for five hundred dollars, oh, interesting. You know, for a thousand dollars, for for two thousand dollars, right? And we didn't really. It was it was a little bit like Mickey in the Night Kitchen or 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 the uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice, where we didn't know what was going on, but suddenly people started traveling to collect these things for free, and then one day, I think August first, Bob Iger walked through through a friend of a friend. He minted number you know crypto venetian number 540 or something like that and, and, Seth, and then for those all who don't know, broke loose for those who don't know bob Iger, well now again ceo of, of disney yeah yeah so he came through he minted his crypto venetian suddenly the you know words like floor price became more prevalent hmm. it doubled and 
we knew we were on to something, you know, that we, we had, there was a pulse and it was exciting and it was weird because we were giving away, you know, magic internet money. Um, but, you know, some of us were, you know, in our 20s, some were older, mm. you know, the, I knew that these things didn't, that this doesn't come around very often. There was a lot of goodwill. There was a lot of community formation around it. And, you, you, um, you and Derek were in your 20s back then. Yeah. Truly. Yeah. <laughs> Both of us. <laughs> Derek, we, we had some really good counsel. Like, I think, you know, Derek yeah. and Steven, Aaron Wright, uh, you mm. know, Fred Wilson got involved. Yeah. Um, Jess Sloss, Cooper Trooper. Yeah. Um, it was a good group. And it was so a good group. It was a really good group. And it was a good, it was a very special time yeah. where we all felt really hopeful about crypto. And we could say NFTs and not feel embarrassed. Right. And it wasn't because we were all greedy. We were just really optimistic and positive about the creative opportunities to be more self-sustaining. You know, we never raised money. We never had any venture capitalists. We were just doing what we were doing and having fun and people were buying into it. And when we decided to sort of extend this roadmap and say, mm. okay, well, we're never going to mint more than a thousand in one location. Cause it takes, you know, we could only do 20 or 30 a day. We said, okay, well maybe, you know, 10,000, is the canonical number mm. of PFPs. There's 10,000 crypto punks, right? There's 10,000 apes. Um, and we said, okay, well, let's tune this DAO to do 10,000 of these crypto citizens across 10 different cities and then call it a day. And so if, you know, crypto punks minted out in a couple hours, you know, bright moments, crypto citizens will mint out in three years. Yeah. And so we are 7,000 citizens done through what will be 10,000 once we get through Buenos Aires in October, city number nine in February, and then the last city, city number 10, will be Venice, Italy uh, next April. Amazing. And Seth, when you say call it a day, uh, what does that maybe, what does that mean for you? Um, you know, I think a lot of people want to know and have ideas about what should come after the 10th city. Um, What's cool about being a project as opposed to being a company is this project and this product in particular, which are the crypto citizens, as, as Derek puts it, like it was designed for completion. It doesn't mean the bright moments doesn't continue to thrive and, and provide value to the community. It just means that we will have completed this roadmap for this particular product, which is minting crypto citizens uh, to people in each city to get to 10,000 the business model that we came up with is really interesting, which is for every city, you know, take Tokyo, um, we sold 333 um, mint passes to mint a crypto Tokyoite. We airdropped 333 to existing, to the 6,000 existing holders. Mm. So you had a 333 over 6,000 chance mm. of getting a free crypto Tokyoite mint. And then, we, and then we gave away locally to the local Japanese community in Tokyo 334 free mint passes mm. to come and mint a crypto Tokyoite. And we do that in each city to, to kind of institutionalize a kind of diversity, you know, economically, um, regionally, yeah. you know, psycho psychographically as well. Uh, this is awesome. I, um, I have I'm, so many follow-ups, but go yeah, ahead. No, 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 go for <laughs> no, it. No, no, go for it. Go I ahead. actually, um, so I, I would be curious to hear Seth, as you've gone through city by city and you've interacted with folks who are, who are locals to each of the cities that, that you've, you've um, done these, these drops in, I'm curious how their response has been past the city. Like, are these, have these um, individuals become core members of the DAO? Are they participating by going to additional cities in the future? I'm curious to, to hear a little bit about, um, the interactions that you've had locally and whether that has expanded globally for those members as time has gone on. It's probably been the most awesome, rewarding thing in all this, honestly. Um, cause I, and I spent a lot of years as an entrepreneur, um, hearing a lot about community, mm. but sort of dismissing it as, as, as being something, intangible and something that was like, you know, the internet community is like chat rooms. Um, but, you know, there's something that's been so visceral and real about this period of meeting people, I think for all of us in the space, 
but definitely within the Bright Moments kind of ecosystem because there was a really clear beginning date that coincided with the end, end-ish of a really traumatic period for all of us. You know, it was kind of like post-war. It was post-pandemic. And so we all, for those two years, stopped all the traveling and stopped where we were going and settled down into one place. And we were all lonely in very small groups. And we met a lot of people online, right? right. So there's all this like pent up social connectivity that we were feeling, but it was only digital, it was in our heads. And so I remember when we went from Venice to do the Crypto New Yorkers, and we got a lease on an amazing uh, uh, Worcester Street Great gallery location. in New York where we did a Jeff Davis show called Reflections. We did Tyler Hobbs in Complete Control, and we minted a thousand Crypto New Yorkers. And I remember that it was an amazing mix of local New Yorkers who were joining the project and minting their New Yorkers, but then also these Venice community folks from LA that had gotten free airdrops and tra made the travel and came to New York um, and minted. And the feeling of meeting, of sort of meeting new people in New York while you're also seeing people from six months ago that you minted, that in a way, I mean, thanks to you and, <coughs> and Stephen, our roadmap and our distribution model for the tokens institutionalize this kind of experience. Hmm. And then when we went to Berlin, it was hard to get to Berlin, right? The word broken out with Ukraine. This was, you know, April of, of last year. The word broken out. COVID was still a thing. Berlin was just coming, you know, out of um, COVID restrictions. Um, and there's no direct flights from New York or LA to Berlin, or there wasn't at the time. And so we were in this huge warehouse at Kraftwerk, 80,000 square feet, um, we were minting crypto Berliners, but we were also minting 10 artists uh, that kind of formed the, the Berlin collection. And, um, and every once in a while, there'd be, you know, mostly Germans, and then someone would show up off the plane, you know, from LA, <laughs> or someone would show up from New York. And I remember, you know, Stephen, your partner was there, you know, every, you know, for the first, whatever, three or four nights at Kraftwerk, minting his citizens. And it just felt it felt familiar and new at the same time. It felt very mm. human. It felt really good. And then you compound that when we went to London and we had chance encounters with people from London, but also people from Berlin and people from New York and people from L.A. Some people had gone to every single one of them. Right. Yeah. And so in each community, we're carrying forward um, community members who, who show up at the next city. We're also meeting people that join the team. Mm. Right. And so. In Berlin, we met, in, you know, in, in New York, we met Future Ace, Keith, you know, who runs Tokenomics, um, who's probably, you know, the guru of gurus on Dutch auctions. Um, in Berlin, we met Malta, yeah. um, you know, who's Love a really Malta. important curator of ours and works, works with, you know, with Glitch Gallery. Um, in London, we met Samir, you know, Spongenuity and his wife, Hanan, that helped run that sub DAO. Um, in Mexico, we met uh, Leo, who runs a sub DAO there. In London, we met Finger Code. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like every, you know, in in London, we, you know, proof of people was happening. And so we met a lot of the Tez artists. We met yeah. Zancan there. We met Seifert. We met um, Kim Asendorf, Andreas mm -hmm. Giesen. You know, they I remember they came to mint their Londoners. And while they were doing that, they were minting on FX hash because they had to push out a release. Mm -hmm. And we're like, what's this FX hash? Right. And next thing you know. You know, Kim is part of Tokyo, yeah. Or, yeah. and we're doing FX hack shows in Mexico. So, each you know the roadmap that's sort of conditioned by these tokens and conditioned by this distribution plan has driven these really great collisions and interactions with artists and collectors. And Tokyo was the best one yet. I mean, Tokyo brought that to a boil. Yeah, and um, Seth, Seth, I've I'm heard still you living off the high. <laughs> I've heard you describe Tokyo in those terms a couple of times now as sort of this coalescing uh, of all things, bright moments to date. Uh, why did it feel like that to you? I mean, I can say from my perspective, the, the, the contrast between the generative art minting experience at the Asakura uh, house, which is this hundred year old uh, heritage building, very sort of quiet, and a whole experience in and of itself contrasted with the lively, energetic 
digital garage minting and citizen minting in the evening with, with music and dancing and drink, uh, as I've told Derek and others, really felt impactful as this representative moment of a movement. Uh, but from your perspective, why did Tokyo maybe feel like a special moment? Um, I mean, it was, it was the most involved you know, event yet. Like it took a you know, real six months. Um, and there was also a lot of excitement for Tokyo, you know, from the team, from the artists, you know, from the community. You know, we, in addition to the generative collection, which was the Tokyo collection, you know, which was, you know, Takawo and Kabibi and, and Zankan and Lars and Kettle and Melissa and others, Spongenuity, Kim, Jeff, probably leaving out. <laughs> I think you, know, you almost got all one other. Lee yeah. Shahi. You're, you're, um, getting, you're yes. getting an angry email from somebody after this. <laughs> somebody. This is the 10th, 11th one. Um, it's always, it's a, it should be 10, but it's always 11 because we have to include Jeff Davis in every yes. city, right? Um, I'm going to Jeff. I love we, my piece. We also, you know, we um, invited AI artists to participate and we just reached out to the top list that we could think of and they all said yes because of Tokyo. I mean, yes, because mm. of bright moments, but people wanted to be in Tokyo, so we felt that. Um, and, and I think, you know, by fusing, you know, great workshops, you know, Matt Desi did a workshop, yes. um, all, you know, most of the artists were there um, talking about their recently minted work, um, great food. You know, every night was a really interesting dinner and one was on boats, one was at a uh, kind of a, a brutalist Omotosando gallery space, you know, with Pace Gallery. The last night was in, you know, the Okocha street food. So it wasn't a bunch of one-off things. Everything built and, and the minting experiences were special, right? Yeah. And, and we still think of, and the problem with Blur, and there's so many benefits, is mm. it makes you think that NFTs are little profile pictures that are like pork bellies. Yeah. And I think what we're devoted to at Bright Moments is showing that like there's so many ways to experience art that fall outside of the box. Yeah, God, um, we could we could continue for hours talking about this. I'll, I'll say a couple of things, and then I know we're near the end of the show, uh, so I'd love to get your final thoughts on where Bright Moments is going. But I think the thing that I reflect on every time we connect, Seth, and every time you know I've I, I've watched the the product and the platform and the citizen and the DAO just. Um, continue to expand its vision under these very tight constraints is there's a, there's this old, you know, child like video game called Katamari where you start off as this little ball and you start picking up the things around you. It could be like mm -hmm. a, a leaf or it could be, you know, a litter on the street or it could be, you know, something else. And then over time the ball gets bigger and it starts to pick up a trash can and then it starts to pick up a street sign and then it starts to pick up, you know, the, a big tree and, uh, until, you know, eventually you're starting to pick up, you know, full blocks and then full cities and then you have full, the entire earth and all of a sudden you're starting to pick up stars and galaxies and it, it feels like the tight constraints around the DAO and the citizens have led to very creative results around how the product and the vision and the people in the DAO have expanded over time, but everyone just sticks around for the next thing. And it just continues to get bigger into things like Tezos art or AI art, or, you know, what it means to play with the live experience into food and into these locations. And so it's just, I, I'll, uh, I'll just say it's been awesome to watch you work and to watch this thing take on a life of its own and, and the people be the through line as it continues to persist and get bigger. Um, so great work, Seth, and awesome to, awesome to, to watch this thing unfold. And I guess maybe in the last 30 seconds would be great to hear you know, your final thoughts on bright moments and where you think this thing will end up. Um, we're on to Cincinnati, which is the, the football reference from Bill Belichick. Um, we're on to Buenos Aires, you know, Buenos Aires, you know, every, every city has to be different. Every city has to show you that you can experience crypto art in really fundamentally different ways that mm. changes your assumptions. And so, you know, from Berlin, which was monumental to London, which was tiny, to Mexico, which was festive and spiritual, to Tokyo, which is, you know, as, as you pointed out, is was, you know, cyberspace, you know, mm -hmm. Blade Runner meets, you know, historic, you know, Meiji temple, Zen art. I think Buenos Aires is going to be more outside. It's going to be, it's like the, you know, going, you know, as Phil put it, you know, from Tokyo to Buenos Aires is about going from the middle of the world to the end of the world. Mm -hmm. And how do we lean into uh, South America? 
as, as a continent and South American artists and give them a voice and help them uh, teach others how to do generative art, how to do AI art, you know, in Spanish, um, how to um, create deeper conversations between artists um, themselves and with collectors and just make it flow beautifully and then do something um, outside. Yeah. Awesome. So I think the challenge for us now is like, how do we think about the natural landscape? Mm. So can you do things that are on chain, but offline as yeah. it were, and think about, you know, not just five or 10 years, but how do you create things for, you know, 10,000 years in the future? Well, we're, we're excited to see what you cook up, Seth. Uh, big fans of the, the product here. And um, thanks for joining us on the show today. Thanks for having me. Cool. Yeah, thanks so much, Seth. Eli, Sam, if you're still around, this has been an awesome one. Yes. Um, glad to get you guys in the booth here. And we'll continue with another awesome 100 Proof next Friday. Take it easy, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys.